One day, Sarah Rosen's sixth grade teacher announced that their school would be reenacting the Constitutional Convention of 1787, but he said only boys could take part since only men had participated in the convention. Sarah was furious, but she seemed to be the only one who cared enough to do anything about it. How could one girl change the whole school? At first, it sounded like a great idea to Sarah Rosen and her classmates in Mr. Starshevsky's sixth grade class. Students at the Musil School in South Bend, Indiana would reenact the Constitutional Convention, where delegates from 12 of the 13 new states drew up and signed the U.S. Constitution. Mr. Starr, that's what everyone called their teacher, explained that each of the fourth, fifth, and sixth grade classes would be a state. Students in each class would elect delegates who would dress up in costumes of the time and pretend to be the original delegates to the convention. Mr. Starr said that their class would be South Carolina and that they would elect four delegates. Sarah looked around the room, measuring her chances to be elected. There were 21 students in her class, 10 girls and 11 boys. She was well known and liked, but so were plenty of others. Well, maybe, she thought, and then Mr. Starr dropped the bomb. Half the class isn't going to like this, he said, but only boys can be delegates, and only boys will be allowed to vote for delegates. Sarah felt tears beginning to build as she raised her hand. Why can't girls be delegates? Mr. Starr explained that the teachers wanted the event to be as close to history as possible. Since there had been no women delegates back then in Philadelphia, he said, there would be no girl delegates now at Musil School. Sarah hated discrimination of any kind. She didn't care what happened 200 years ago. To her, this was just plain discrimination against girls. Besides, nearly half of the boys in the school and in her class were black or Asian or Hispanic. So 200 years ago, they wouldn't have they would have been left out too. But at Musil, only girls were going to be left out. What did that say about how her teacher felt about the rights of women? Sarah wanted to say a million things at once, but she knew she didn't speak well when she was angry. She waited for the bell to ring, then rushed past her friends to her locker and boarded the bus. She was already crying by the time she got home. Sarah, what's wrong, her mother said. She wiped her tears on her sleeve and told the story. The telling itself seemed to clear her head, and an idea came. She would organize a counter-demonstration of the girls in her class. Let the boys walk around in costumes and pretend to be delegates if they wanted. The girls would take to the halls, chanting and singing in protest. They would represent the women the Constitution forgot in 1787. There wasn't much time to lose. It was Friday night, and the mock convention was scheduled for the next Wednesday. Sarah picked up the phone and called the classmates she thought she could count on the most. Jennifer Spinsky and the Wyan sisters, Betsy and Jennifer. They were angry too. One idea led to another. Signs they could make, songs they could sing. They made up chants and slogans. When Sarah hung up, her mother took the phone and called the principal, Dr. Calvin, to object as a parent to the all-male convention. Sarah listened carefully to her mother's end of the conversation. It sounded as though Dr. Calvin didn't even know about the boys' only rule. Her mother handed the phone to Sarah. Dr. Calvin said she agreed the rule was wrong. She would gather the teachers before school on Monday morning and give them a choice. Either they had to let the girls in, or to be accurate to the period, they also had to keep out boys who weren't white. It would be up to each teacher. Come see me second period on Monday, Dr. Calvin said. When Sarah got to school on Monday, she went right to Mr. Starr. She wanted to know which way he had decided. He seemed amused. 
Nothing had changed at all, he said. But didn't Dr. Calvin tell you, Sarah asked? His voice hardened, no changes, and that was final. When the bell for second hour rang, Sarah went into the principal's office. Dr. Calvin closed the door. Well, she said. Sarah reported her conversation with Mr. Starr. Dr. Calvin frowned. Sarah looked at her, trying to decide whether to tell her that she was organizing a protest. It was an important decision. If Dr. Calvin approved, they could use the halls without fear of punishment, no matter what the teachers said. And it would be easier to talk her classmates into it if Sarah could assure them they wouldn't get in trouble with the principal. But if Dr. Calvin didn't approve, she would be watching for them, and she would tell the teachers. There would be no way to surprise them then, and kids would be scared. Sarah decided to risk it. Dr. Calvin was a woman, and she was black. Probably she had known discrimination in her own life. Even if she said no, Sarah was determined to protest anyway. There were only three days left to organize. She might as well find out what she was up against now. Dr. Calvin, Sarah said tentatively, if Mr. Starr isn't going to change his mind, some of us are planning to demonstrate in the halls during the convention. Sarah thought there might have been a faint smile on the principal's lips. Dr. Calvin shrugged. Well, she said, then I guess you have to do what you have to do. Sarah climbed the ladder to the wooden loft in the back of the classroom and surveyed her classmates. Out of Mr. Starr's sight, the protesting girls met in the loft each day to make posters. Of the 15 girls in the classroom, eight had told Sarah they were solidly behind the protest. A ninth had said she wanted to play in the school band at the convention. That left six. They would probably do whatever Ashley did. Ashley was a pretty and popular girl who was well aware of her social power. She had groaned like all the other girls when Mr. Starr had announced his decision, but she hadn't done anything since. Sarah decided she needed to know where Ashley stood before she went after anyone else. Sarah asked Ashley if she was planning to demonstrate. No, Ashley said, and it was wrong to spoil a day of celebration by doing something disruptive. Sarah tried to keep her temper in check. She couldn't afford to anger Ashley. I know what you mean, she said thoughtfully, but how can you celebrate when we're being discriminated against? She said she'd think about it and walked away. Soon, Sarah saw Andy Bauer coming toward her. What did he want? The boys had elected Andy as a delegate that morning. Maybe he wanted to gloat. He was grinning. I quit, he said triumphantly. I've already written a resignation letter to Mr. Starr. He, I told him I didn't want to be a delegate because it wasn't fair to the girls. Mr. Starr just said, if that's what you want to do. Now the other boys say they won't take my place as a delegate. Sarah was thrilled. This would energize everyone. Now Mr. Starr was in a real jam. Where would he get delegates if the boys wouldn't serve and the girls couldn't? But when a second boy tried to resign, Mr. Starr went to a different class and borrowed a boy delegate. And he announced that after Andy, he would allow no other delegates to quit. There was a that's final sound to his voice. Though she didn't admit it to anyone, Sarah was a little scared. This was only the second week of school and Sarah didn't really know Mr. Starr. He controlled everything from their grades to how much recess they could have. If he formed an early impression of her as a troublemaker, he could make the rest of the year miserable. Word was already around the school that all the teachers except Mrs. Mills and Mr. Starr were letting girls take part. Mrs. Mills was keeping out girls and boys of color. That made Mr. Starr the only teacher with an anti-girl policy. Sarah wasn't about to back down and now it was clear Mr. Starr wouldn't either. She hoped she wasn't headed for big trouble. Sarah woke on the day of the march excited and nervous. 
She lay in bed, looking around her room at posters of Martin Luther King, Mohandas Gandhi, and Marilyn Monroe. She wondered how many people would protest. Ashley still hadn't said for sure, and neither had Ashley's friends. One thing that might make a difference was that one of the protesters' parents had called a reporter from the local paper. The reporter and a photographer were supposed to show up outside Mr. Starr's class at 9.45. Maybe when the undecided girls saw the chance to get in the paper, they would join. Sarah hoped so. She would prefer that every marcher be dedicated to women's rights, but she'd let people join for whatever reasons they wanted to. At 9.45, the delegates left the classroom with Mr. Starr. The other students were supposed to wait in the classroom. Instead, the protesting girls and four boys led by Andy Bauer went out into the hall with their signs and posters. The reporter and photographer were waiting for them as they assembled in a two by two line. Every girl in the class except one was there, including Ashley, who was holding a big sign, women demand equality. It said, women are people, said another. Sarah grabbed her own sign and placed it squarely in front of her. It read, we, the people, people was crossed out and white men put in its place. Okay, she said, let's go. They began to move forward singing, we shall overcome Voices ringing, they tromped down the stairs to where the kids in the lower grades had their classrooms. Some teachers let their children cluster in the doorways to cheer the marchers, but one teacher snapped, be quiet, and slammed the classroom door. Sarah felt powerful inside. She was acting on her beliefs. In the beginning, Mr. Starr had told them, half of the class isn't going to like this, but he didn't seem to expect that they would actually do something about it. When the delegates returned to the classroom, so did the marchers. Word came from the office that three other reporters were waiting to interview Sarah. Later, when she had time to think, Sarah asked herself what had they accomplished. She didn't believe the protest had changed Mr. Starr. He seemed just as set in his ways. He told the reporters that he had left girls out on purpose to cause controversy and teach them a lesson about the fight for the right of women to vote. She did not believe him for a minute. <laughs> but maybe she and the other students had changed. They had taken a stand for something they believed in. They had shown that they wouldn't accept being discriminated against. A lot of younger kids had seen them and were asking the protesters questions about why they had done it. Surely it would be harder for their school to plan something unfair again. Most important of all to Sarah, they had probably raised consciousness about women's rights in their school. By her action, she had said that she was as good as anyone else and deserved a chance to share in whatever the school had to offer. As Dr. Calvin had put it, she did what she had to do. And so let's, uh, let's join in solidarity with our, with our protesters from Musil School and, and sing a little song ourselves now. Why don't we... So much hurt, so much exclusion, so much hate and difference in the world. One hardly knows where to begin, but I know, I know, deep in the deepest heart of my hearts that I must do something about it. I must be on the side of those who are pushed out. I must be their ally. And so that, that is what I choose to do. I am going to be an ally. There, done, did it. Yay me, I'm a hero. <laughs> you doubt me? Is this not enough to call myself an ally? Is, is, is there something more that has to be done? Probably, yeah. Our kids probably remember our story last week about making promises and what it means to keep them. And if you were here listening about trust and trusting in oneself last week, you know that I said, we are already a promise to the world. 
Everything that is within us is a promise that it is upon us to keep. And this is as well. This promise to stand with those who are being pushed down. There is more to be done than simply saying, I will be there. I have to be there, standing with them, showing up, doing something, saying something. But it's hard to know what to do and it's hard to know what to say sometimes. So we have these lovely little pocket cards here today. They're in a basket in the back, a bunch of them folded up and a bunch that you can take home and do your own origami with. This comes from the teaching tolerance program at the Southern Poverty Law Center. It's geared towards our school-aged kids, but it's, it's good advice for our adults as well. The things we need to do when we see someone being pushed down, harmed, excluded, interrupt the interaction. Speak up against every biased remark, every time, in the moment, without exception. Think about what you'll say ahead of time so you're prepared to act instantly. Try saying something like, I don't like words like that, or that sort of phrasing is very hurtful. Question what others are saying. Ask simple questions in response to hateful remarks to find out why the speaker made the offensive comment and how you can address the situation. What do you mean by that word? What do you mean by that thing you just said about them? Could you explain that to me? In the words of one of my mentors, take a dumb pill. Make them explain themselves. Educate. Explain why a term or phrase is offensive. Encourage the person to choose a different expression. Hate isn't behind all hateful speech. Sometimes it's ignorance or lack of exposure to a diverse population. Hey, do you know the history of that word? Do you know why people say that? And echo. If someone else is speaking up against hate, thank them. Back the message up. One person's voice is a great start. Many voices are what eventually create change. Thank you for speaking up. Thank you so much. We want to try a couple of scenarios here. We're going to read this little script here. And then you're going to tell us what you would do. Hi, Mr. Jacobs. Hi, Shannon. This is my mom. Call me Jane. Hi, Jane. Nice to meet you. I heard about the new rugby team starting today, and I want to sign up. <laughs> you're kidding, right? Rugby is not a girl's sport. Why not? It's a very rough game. We should get, she would get flattened out there. It just is not safe. Well, I'm a pretty tough girl. I play soccer and I've gotten kicked before lots of times. I can handle it. Yeah, you say that now, but you do not even know what the game is like. No, no, I'm, I'm sorry. We can't have any girls in rugby. So what would you do if you were Shannon? What would you do if you were Shannon's mom? Or if you were a friend of hers and you heard this conversation in passing? What if you were a boy who was there to join the rugby team? What would you say? Nobody was expecting to be put on the spot this morning. <laughs> Could she ask for tryouts? Let's form a girls' team. Let's form a girls' team. I'm sorry? <laughs> Title IX, there you go. <laughs> it's nice to have that backing you up, too. All right. 
we're not into we're not into examples today. You can do another one. That's all right. Uh, we're going to close on a video here. If you were here for our uh, teach-in on racism last year, you saw this before, but it's always good to watch this probably more than annually. This is Francesca Lee uh, from YouTube with some words, final words, on how to be an ally. Hey friends! So I'm trying something different with my setup, and I don't know if it's working, but you will deal. <laughs> Imagine your friend is building a house, and they ask you to help, but you've never built a house before. So it'd probably be a good idea for you to put on some productive gear and listen to the person in charge, otherwise someone's gonna get seriously hurt. Look, I'm helping! It's the exact same idea when it comes to being an ally. An ally is a person that wants to fight for the equality of a marginalized group that they're not a part of. We need your help building this house, but you probably should listen so you know what to do first. Let's do this. So here are my five tips for being a good ally. Understand your privilege. Now, a lot of people get hung up on the word privilege, so let me break it down for you nice and easy. Privilege does not mean that you are rich, that you've had an easy life, that everything's been handed to you and you've never had to struggle or work hard. All it means is that there are some things in life that you will not experience or ever have to think about just because of who you are. It's kind of like those horses that have those blinders on. They can see just fine. There's just a whole bunch of stuff on the side that they don't even know exists. So for example, there are currently 29 states where you can legally be fired for being gay. And there are 34 states where you can legally be fired for being trans. Now as a straight cis woman, those are things that I don't have to ever think about if I don't want to. I'm not going to be fired because I'm straight and I'm not going to be fired because I'm cis. So it makes sense that before I can fight for the rights of others, I have to understand what rights I have and others don't. That's privilege. Listen and do your homework. It sounds like a no-brainer, but it's not possible for you to learn if you aren't willing to listen. So you gotta know when to zip up the lipa. I don't know. You get what I mean. But that's the thing that's so cool about social media. There are so many people sharing their stories all around the world and connecting with people that they normally would never get a chance to without the power of the internet. So do your homework. Start reading blogs, tweets, news articles, and stories so that you can get caught up on the issues that are important to the communities that you want to support. Speak up, but not over. If the fight for equality was a girl group, the ally wouldn't be the lead singer or the second lead singer. They'd be Michelle. An ally's job is to support. You want to make sure that you use your privilege and your voice to educate others, but make sure to do it in such a way that does not speak over the community members that you're trying to support or take credit for things that they are already saying. This isn't Mario Kart. Stay in your lane. Realize that you're going to make mistakes and apologize when you do. Nobody's perfect. Unlearning problematic things takes time and work, so you are bound to mess up and trip and fall. No okay. gun. But don't worry, you can brush yourself off and get right back up. I'm back up! Just remember that it's not about your intent, it's about your impact. So when you get called out, make sure to listen, apologize, commit to changing your behavior, and move forward. Last but certainly not least, Actually, the most important thing on this list is remember that ally is a verb. Saying you're an ally is not enough. You gotta do the work. One through four, one through four. As always, there are links in the video description box to some of the things I mentioned in this video, along with some resources that have been really helpful for me as I've gone along in my journey to. And I'll uh, send out a link to that video so you can see all those links later on.